Well, it's great to have everybody here. We are in our fourth week of our series that we're calling Choose, where we're going through the values of Advent. And one of the things that I've just loved about this is talking about these values, but also taking a look at, at the reality that we can have all of these things in our life, but we do have to choose them. We do have to choose love. We do have to choose joy. We do have to choose uh, peace in our life. And today we're going to light the fourth candle, and that is the candle of hope that we are gonna talk about choosing hope today. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter one, verse 18. And let's read this together. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. And when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins." And all of this was to take place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken to the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. How many of you in this room would say that you are an avid reader? You enjoy reading a good book. It has to be a good book, right? It has to be, a, it has to be an enjoyable book, but you like to read. We, we have more readers in first gathering than second gathering. That's very interesting to me. Um, it's because you slept in from watching all that TV last night. And so, no shame, no shame. Um, but there, there's something, uh, if you are a reader, there is a difference between being someone who can just read anything and being someone who loves a, a good or a great book. And if you are a, a fiction lover, which I am, my, actually my whole family is, um, my dad probably reads a, at least a book a week. Um, and, and he is just a avid reader, he loves fiction. And, um, I, and I don't get to read as much fiction as I would like to, but I do enjoy it. But there's something about reading a great fictional story that when it is great and you open it and you read it, you can, you can begin to find yourself immersed inside of the story. Great storytellers have the ability to do that in their writing, that they can, they can give you um, such vivid imagery that you feel like you're a part of the story. And maybe, maybe you've done with this with a movie, but, but it's different with a book. Because, I think because there's a large, larger uh, time commitment. There's something about that that you begin to be so inundated with it that you think, oh, well, I could be this character in the book. And, and if that character was going through this particular situation, what must they be feeling or what must they um, it be thinking through that moment? There's something uh, amazing when you read something that you can just dive into. Now, I believe that that gift of that desire to be able to be a part of the story and to really experience it, I think that we're all wired at some level that way. That's why entertainment is so much a part of our culture. But I think that we were given that gift not just for entertainment, but to help us have a, a different understanding of the word of God. You see, I believe that, that we were designed to read the word of God from the posture of picturing yourself in the story. Like not just reading it as a, as a textbook, not just reading it as a history book, but reading it in a way that you open yourself up and you dive right into the story and you ask yourself the questions that we asked about fiction. What is that person thinking in this moment? How are they feeling? What, what does it look like to play a role in that? Now, the difficulty with the Bible, though, is that for many of us, maybe you're newer to faith or maybe... Um, maybe uh, you have just started really diving into scripture, is that for many of the stories that we read in the Bible, it, it, they're not like fiction because we've heard them before. And even in some contexts, we're, we're even explained what they're supposed to mean. 
So when we read uh, Jonah and the whale, or we read uh, Noah's Ark, or we read even the story of the birth of Jesus, we, we almost have like a set of understanding before we may have even read it in scripture ourselves what the story is, what it's about, and what I'm supposed to take away from it. Almost like in Aesop's fables, like we know when we read those stories that there are specific things to them that we're supposed to take out of them. But I would say to you, that the best way to read scripture is to try and find yourself um, laying those things aside, not that they're bad, but finding a way to immerse yourself in the scripture. Because when we do that, we learn different things. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with historical uh, contextual information. I love to study those things and I believe that they actually help us better place ourselves inside of the story. But there are some traditions that we have that kind of taint how we view some stories. And one of those stories is the Christmas story. See, I see two very different Christmas stories. My, my kids are um, three and under, and we got some of those little, you know, those little kid books that they look as big as normal people books, but the pages are like three inches thick. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we got one of those with the Christmas story. And it, this really caused me to think about it when I was reading that to my kids, because the, the story, whether it's in a kid's book or even what we talk about as a culture, when we think about the Christmas story, many of us don't think about it from a, a scriptural context. We think about it from the traditional context, which is slightly different. Now, all of the pieces are the same. The, the, the linear lines of what happens in the story are the same, but the tone is very different. How we understand the story is very different. Traditionally, we have this very pretty, perfect story that's in a box that's got this nice little bow on top of it. And that's not what I read in scripture. There's a lot more drama. There's a lot more tension in the story of the birth of Jesus than what we hear often in tradition. Now, let's walk through the traditional version. Here is a little girl that finds out, a young girl that finds out uh, through an angelic visit that she is pregnant by God. She's a, she's a virgin, she's been chased, all, the, all that kind of stuff. She, she initially is a little concerned, you know, because there's an angel sitting in her living room, but then she's okay, and then she joyfully accepts the responsibility of carrying this baby. Then an angel, through a dream, visits her, her soon-to-be husband, and he's all excited about it too, and then we don't really know much for a few months, and then a few months later, they take a trip to Bethlehem, you know, because every super pregnant woman wants to ride on a donkey for seven days. That sounds like fun. And so they take a, what most people tell us is a five to seven day trip to Bethlehem. And when they get to Bethlehem, they, they get there and find that there's no room in the inn. But that's okay because there's a perfect barn waiting on them when they get there. And they walk into this barn with a, with a very pregnant uh, wife and, and brand new husband and they walk into the barn and it's perfectly laid out for them. There are queen size hay beds everywhere. And if that's not enough, as they lay in their newfound hay beds, there are animals nuzzling them. To, just like being super sweet and keeping them warm. And on top of that, at some point while they're in the barn, Mary effortlessly births the Son of God. Every woman in this room should be going, uh-uh, right? Like there's, there's something about this that just seems absolutely ridiculous. And then the baby Jesus sleeps preciously in a trough while above the barn there is an angel with a halo singing the hallelujah chorus. This is the Christmas story that most of us grew up with. Whether you're from a Christian uh, background or not, this is kind of it. And we not only tell it this way, we sing about it this way. Think about some of the songs that you sang growing up. For instance, think about Away in a Manger. The cattle are lowing, the baby wakes, but Jesus, no crying he makes. Whoa, 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 time out. No crying he makes. How many of you have children? Did crying your babies make? 
crying my baby's made. My babies are still crying, right? Some of you have high school students and you're like, crying my babies still make, right? This, this is ridiculous that we have this perfect story and we, we like it because it's hope filled and it's easy and it, and it makes us feel good about our lives and we, we hear it. The only problem is it's not the story. It, it is the story, but it's not the story. You see, they're both filled with hope, but from two very different perspectives. The traditional story we find hope in because it's nice and it's serene and, it's, and, it, and it sounds good. The only problem with that is that true hope doesn't come out of us in easy scenarios. True hope is found in our life when we choose to hope in God when our situation seems hopeless. That's when we find out that God is the provider and that God is the comforter and that God does stay with us in, in, in situations that are dark. This is, this is what it means to choose hope. And this story is all about choosing hope. Because when you look at this real story, we see people that chose hope despite hopeless situations. And the first thing that they found hopeless was a, a, a basket full of hopeless emotions. Now, I want you to picture this with me for a second, gentlemen. You are... Uh, a, a young guy and you are about to marry a, a woman that you think is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, you think she's perfect. Y'all have been in a relationship for a little bit and you've been completely chased. The relationship has been everything that it's supposed to be, uh, biblical, all that kind of stuff. And you're working towards getting married and your fiance calls you up and says, hey, we need to go talk. Um, do you have time to, to connect at Starbucks here in the next few minutes? And you go, okay. We're gonna probably, you know, you're probably thinking go jump on Amazon, pick out the registry, uh, pick some things out for the registry, or maybe you're gonna talk about how big the wedding party needs to be or something. And you get to Starbucks, you order your drink of choice and you go, you see that she's already waiting on you and you go, hmm, something looks different. Is she glowing? Like you think there's something, there's something wrong here. What, something is different. And you sit down to your, with your fiance and she looks at you and she says, hey, I need to tell you something. And you say, what is it, sweetheart, baby, whatever, put in pet name here. And you say, what, what, what is it? And she says, I, I need to tell you I'm pregnant, but I didn't cheat on you. God made me pregnant. Awkward, right? Like, like th none of us, would go, well, that's good news, right? Like none of us are walking around going, that's easy to, to process. No, we, we even get the idea that when Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant, that, that he was not believing it. I mean, he wouldn't have needed an angel to visit him in a dream if he had just been bought in from day one, right? There is, there is this reality that his emotions in that moment were anything but hopeful. They were hopeless. He probably felt lied to. He probably felt manipulated. He, he probably saw everything about his future changing in an instant. Have you ever had a moment like that where, where you thought your life was gonna look one way, you thought it, it was gonna go a specific route, and all of a sudden, in a conversation, it's different. That's where Joseph found himself. That's where Joseph uh, found himself when he discovered this. And poor Mary, I mean, let's not forget her for a second. She played a small part, right? And th there's this reality that, that she probably didn't know what to do with any of her emotions. I mean, imagine how scared she was. Imagine how scared she would have to be to tell her fiance this. As a matter of fact, most Bible scholars don't even think that she, I shouldn't say, but probably a, a large portion, um, don't even think that she told him. Because I mean, I mean, I'd be avoiding that convo too, right? I mean, that's a, that's a tough conversation. So he figures it out. Not because she, she didn't wanna tell him, but because she didn't know what to do. She felt hopeless. But she chose hope in spite of hopeless emotions. They both chose hope despite 
hopeless decisions as well. I mean, Joseph had three real options, two of them kind of the same and then a third. He first of all could divorce her. He could divorce her publicly, which probably would have gotten her killed because she was pregnant. Or he could divorce her privately, which is what scripture tells us he was planning on doing, which was the more uh, gentle way of, of ending the relationship. Basically to say, I still care about you, but you've done this thing, I'm gonna send you away. Those were the two options that honestly were best for him because it would be like saying, this isn't my child and I'm going to send you off. Now, the third option, which is what he chose, was to stay with her, which in, in our modern context, most people would say, well, obviously that's the better choice. There, the only, there's only one problem. People don't respond, or people didn't respond then the same way that we respond now to people who have babies out of wedlock. This was a very different deal. It was against the law. And not only that, it was considered highly immoral. And for him to do that would be like marking himself for life as someone who had a baby outside of marriage. It was something that would follow him the rest of his life. Not only that, it would also follow his family. See, heritage and, and lineage was very important to Jewish people, still is today. And he was of the line of David, King David, David and Goliath David, that David, which means he was from an important family. There would have been from adolescence a regular conversation about how important it was that they live right because they were from a certain family. It was, it was something that mattered deeply. And for him to choose hope in the face of what it would do to his reputation and to his family's reputation was no small decision. But they chose hope. They chose in, in, a, in a situation where it felt like they had no hope, they chose hope. Poor Mary, Mary didn't even get a decision, right? Like when I read the story either in Luke or in the book of Matthew, I don't get an idea that anybody like asked her permission, right? It was like, hey, you're gonna have a baby, good luck, right? There, now, at the end of the conversation, she does affirm it. She says, be it unto me, right? Like, she does say, I, I, I'm in. But it's kinda like when you're at work and your boss says, you have to do something. And you go, I will gladly do that, right? It's not, it's not the same thing. She didn't see any options in front of her. Yet they both chose Hope. They both chose to hope in the promise that God had given them. They both chose to hope in, in what the angels told them. What did they hope in? They hoped in Emmanuel, which is God with us. They chose to hope in the, in the promise that God said, look, if you'll trust me and you'll believe what we're saying, you'll be a part of something greater than you could ever imagine in your life. And honestly, that's what happens when we choose hope. When we choose hope, what we're ultimately chewing, choosing, not chewing, choosing, is to trust God in a way that we ultimately play a part in the story that he desired us to play from the very beginning. See, you were designed with a purpose. You were designed with a plan. And God knew that from, the, from b before you were even thought of by your parents, that he had something specific for you. But when we, when we struggle with hope, sometimes what we're really doing is backing away from that story that God desires for us to play a part in. But when we choose hope, we're choosing to play a part in the story that God desires for us to play. Have you ever been in a moment where it was difficult to choose hope? Have you ever had a moment where everything around you seemed to not be going the way that you thought it was? Maybe, maybe you got married and you thought that that person was gonna be the person you were gonna spend the rest of your life with and that ended. And, and now you're finding yourself trying to just figure out what life is supposed to look like for the future. Maybe, maybe you had a promising career where you felt set for life and all of a sudden you walk in and you find a pink slip in your box one day. We've all had those moments where it just seems hopeless. 
But the power that is in hope is not when hope is easy to choose, but when hope seems ridiculous to choose. That's where the power of our hope in Christ comes in. That when, when we see no light at the end of the tunnel, when it doesn't look possible for something good to come out of what we're going through, that when we choose that hope, that is when hope really counts. That's when hope really makes a difference in our lives. And if you feel hopeless this morning, you're in good company. Because the two people who are responsible for bringing Jesus into the world felt hopeless. They felt, I'm sure, alone by themselves. And we know that this is something that a room of this size, there are people that struggle in. We know that there are, that there are more that there are more hopeless people in the holiday season than we often like to admit as a culture. We know statistically, this stat is a little old, but we know that in the last studies done that there are more people who actually commit suicide in the holiday season than the rest of the year combined. Because this for many people, while it is a positive season, for others it is a struggle. I talked to one person after, after the first gathering that said, I'm, I'm exactly the boat that you're talking about. I wish it was hope filled. I wish I was happy about this season, but it was tough for me. It's tough for me. We have people in this room that, that fit that bill. But what I wanna tell you is that you don't have to buy into the lie that says that there is no light at the end of the tunnel. You don't have to buy in to the lie of the enemy that tells you that you're all alone. You can choose hope. Now the question is, how do we choose hope? What does it look like to choose hope? I wanna give you three thoughts from this story about how we can choose hope in our own life. And the first thing is this. The first way that, that we choose hope is this. We choose hope by being open to the voice of God. We choose hope by being open to the voice of God. I think that one of the greatest lies that the enemy tells us when we're going through difficulty is that God is far away and that he is not speaking to us. This, this is the lie that so often we buy into. That we, because we feel alone, we take that as reality that we are alone, even though that is not true and that is a lie from the enemy. The, and then this other lie that God isn't speaking. Many of us would look at a story like the birth of Jesus or we would look at other things in the scripture and we go, well, yeah, it's probably easy for them to choose hope because they got an angel. I got no angel. No angel appearing to me at my house, right? And I gotta be honest with you, if I gotta go through some of the stuff that these people went through, I'm good with no angel. You know what I'm saying? Like, I will be okay if I never get an angelic visit. But for many of us, we look at that and we don't, we don't think we don't think about what they went through in, in proportion to how God showed up. What we just see is God showed up in that way for them, but God's not showing up in that way for me. And many of us miss out on the truth that God is speaking. Whether you hear it or not, God is speaking to you. God is always speaking to us. Even when we don't want him to speak to us, he is speaking to us. The problem that we have is not that God isn't speaking or that God is distant, but that when we go through life, when we go through trauma, when we go through drama in our life, what we find is that all of those things are so loud that we are incapable of hearing the voice of God. There's a passage in 1 Kings chapter 19 that actually gives a brilliant picture of this. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. I'm gonna read from it real quick. It says, and he, he being the Lord, said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore through the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake came. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. Y'all didn't know earth, wind, and fire was in the Bible, did you? After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire came a sound of a low whisper. I have found in my own life, and, and I will throw out that it might be different for you. 
But I've found in my own life and in the ministry that God has had, had me serve over the last several years that I rarely have the ability to hear the voice of God in the midst of my chaos. I rarely have the ability to hear the, the voice of God in the middle of the winds of people's voices and opinions that so often surround me. I, I rarely have the ability to hear the voice of God when it feels like the fire of my circumstances is engulfing around me. But I find the voice of God when I choose to put myself in a position to turn all of that down and stop and listen for a still, small voice. For many of us, the reason we don't hear God in our issues that we have, it's not because he's not talking, it's because we haven't put ourselves in a position, in a posture to look at everything going on and say, I'm gonna lay it aside for a minute because I just need to hear the voice of God. I just need to hear his voice. I just need to hear that. And, and the thing is, when we go a long time without hearing the voice of God, without hearing him whisper something into our soul, what happens so, for so many of us is this, that it lowers our hope level. See, there's something about hearing his, his voice and his encouragement that raises our hope level, that makes it a little easier in, in the midst of adversity to choose hope. But when I go through circumstances that are difficult, when I go through circumstances that are traumatic, what so often happens is I go through these really long stretches of time without making space for him to speak and therefore I find myself with a lower hope level or even my hope dying. Where would Joseph and Mary be if they hadn't have listened to the voice of the Lord? I think it's no, no accident that the angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream. Why? Because it's the one place that we knew he would be quiet. And for some of us, what we need to do is to learn to find a place where we can quiet ourselves to hear what the, the voice of the Lord has to say to us. If we're gonna choose hope, we have to choose to be open to the voice of the Lord. The second thing is this, is that we have to choose to stay. We have to choose to stay. I, I, wanna, I wanna offer something to you this morning, and that is this, that I think that our culture has two great issues. Now, there are other issues we could talk about, um, but I think that our culture has two great issues. And the first issue is this. I believe that we have a staying problem. I believe that we have a staying problem. We don't stay in relationships. Many don't stay in marriages. We, I can tell you after being in ministry for a while, uh, lots of people don't stay in church. I, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I worked on staff at a church in, a, in another state. And uh, when I was working there, we got two phone calls in the same week one time. And the phone calls were like this. We had a lady who called and she said, hey, I think I'm gonna have to leave your church. She said, I don't want to, but I'm just, I'm just fed up. I'm, I'm done. And we said, well, what's... What's the problem? Tell us what the issue is. And she said, it's, it's your sanctuary. It's too cold. Y'all think I'm joking. I'm not joking. That was the phone call. She said, it's too cold. I'm going to the Methodist church where it's warmer. I'm not even sure what that means, right? Like she just assumed Methodists got the heat, you know? And so she, she decided that and she said, I'm going to the Methodist church. We said, well, look, we don't want you to leave. You've been in our church a really long time. This lady had been in our church for a couple of decades. Like she'd been there a while. She said, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I'm gonna go there. Maybe I'll come back in a few weeks, but I'm going where it's warmer, you know, because Florida is so frigid. And so same week, we get a call from a gentleman. And the gentleman actually has a very similar complaint. And, he's, and this is the same week. They're talking about the same Sunday morning. And he says, hey, man, I, I, I'm gonna have to figure out something. I don't know that I can go, go to church on Sunday anymore. And I said, why not? I remember, I remember, hearing, I, I remember hearing the first story. I talked to the second guy and he said, I, I, just, I just can't take it anymore. It's too hot. Y'all have all those air conditioners on top of that building. I don't know what y'all are saving them for. This is Florida. We want it cold inside. Jesus can't work if it's not cold, you know? And I mean, he just, he was so uh, just abrasively upset 
that it was too hot in the building. This is no joke. The same room, the same Sunday, the same gathering. One person wanted to leave because it was too cold and the other too hot. We have a staying problem. People get upset because, because the pastor says something that offends them. That's not being offended. That's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And if you'll stay a little while, God might actually do something in your life. That may have made nobody else feel good. It felt like therapy to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, there, there's just this truth that we have a staying problem. When things get uncomfortable, when we get upset, when somebody frustrates us, we have a natural propensity as Americans to bail. If my oven won't do it quickly or the way that I want it, I'll put it in the microwave. If I don't like that, I can go buy a ceramic smoker and let it take a million hours to cook my food. We want our options and we want it the way we want it, how we want it. And the problem with that is that we, we don't recognize the power in staying. That many times we miss out what God wants to do in and through our lives because we're too quick to make the, the decision that is most convenient for us. And Joseph chose to stay. Joseph chose to stay when it seemed ridiculous to stay. Joseph chose to stay even though he had plenty of reasons not to stay. And I would just submit to you this morning that, that maybe the reason that we struggle with hope is that we're, that we're so distracted with the options that we think that we have that we don't choose to press into the Lord to give us hope for the moment that's difficult. Joseph chose to stay. He chose to be open to the voice of the Lord. They also chose to stay. And then lastly, he chose to care more about the promise of God than man's opinion. I told you that there were two things that I think we struggle with as a culture. And I think that the second is this, that we struggle with being obsessed with the acceptance and the affirmation of those around us. We struggle with this. We've built our culture around social media platforms. And look, I'm not dogging social media. I've got a Facebook and an Instagram. I had a Snapchat once, but I felt like I was 80 on there because I was the only person over 25. So I kept it for about five minutes and then got rid of it, right? Anybody else with me? Millennials, uh, you, we're just too old. Uh, but we're obsessed with, we're obsessed with what other people think about us. If we post a, a picture of our dog and 30 people don't like it and two people share it and five people comment on it, it actually affects our emotions. That, that's not even my opinion. That's, there are studies out there that, that show how unhealthy this is. Why? Because we're obsessed with the approval of man. What I would say to you this morning is this, why do you care so much? Because what I found in my life and probably what you found in yours is that rarely does the approval of man and the obedience of God happen at the same time. There's some of you that you're gonna walk through doors this Christmas where they don't understand anything about your life because they don't follow Jesus. And they're gonna be very unapproving. And it's difficult, it's painful when all you want is for your family to just get it and just be okay with it. And I would just say to you, why do you care so much? What, what if you chose to care less about the people that only care about you as much as they can talk about you? And you start to care about the God who created you for the purpose that he's trying to get you to that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and that God knows you more intimately than anyone else. He knows the numbers of hair on your head. That's how deeply God knows you. And God created you with a purpose just like he created Mary and Joseph for a purpose. But in order for them to get to the purpose that God had for them, it required them to choose God's promise for my life 
or, or the approval of man. It, it took them choosing one of those two. And Joseph walked away. There, there's not even, a, they walked away in a, in a way that would have been shameful. They walked away that would have been embarrassing. There's not even, uh, there, there's not even like a, a record, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, of them having a, like a proper wedding because they wouldn't have in that culture. They walked away with the opinions of man beating them up and causing them pain because they chose hope, not in will they accept me, but will I honor God by following the promise that he's laid in front of me? This, this morning, I wanna ask you the question, are you choosing hope? Are you choosing hope? Are you choosing to listen to the voice of God and, the, and choosing to, to hope in the promise of God? Or have you become so tired and so distracted by the circumstances of your life that all you can see is the opinion of man? Are you so, are you so, um, inundated with the voices of your circumstances and the hopelessness that you feel that you've lost the ability to hear the voice of God? Does every moment that you feel stressful make you think, well, I could just go somewhere else. I could, ju I just need to get out. And are you so obsessed with what everybody else says that it keeps you from keeping your eyes on Jesus? I told you earlier that if you are hopeless today, it's okay. Maybe you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe you don't see, maybe you don't see that it can work for the good, but my God says that all things can work for the good. Maybe, maybe you don't see that, but you're in good company because all it takes is choosing to base your life not on what you see, but on the God of hope. Will you bow your heads with me all over this room this morning? Maybe you're in here today and you say, I'm just, I just am not choosing hope. You know, I, I'm not gonna ask this morning who feels hopeless because I think that probably there's a large majority of us that have some places in our own life where we feel hopeless. But, but are you in here today and you say, you know what? I'm not choosing hope right now. I've got some things going on and I'm not choosing hope. But I don't wanna leave this place without choosing hope. If you're in here and you say, I'm not choosing hope, but I really want to this morning. Would you lift your hand all over this room? Would you lift your hand all over this room? Yeah, I see, I see your hand. I see your hands in the back. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I see you, I see you. I wanna, I wanna pray for you in just a second. Um, I, I didn't do this in the first gathering, but I feel like, um, I, I just, I feel like I'm supposed to ask one more question. And that is, that there's some of you, and this is not at all connected to what I was talking about, but there's some of you that experience high levels of anxiety in this season. That you, you experience high levels of anxiety in this season. Uh, would, would you mind, you say, yeah, that's me. And I'd love, I'd love some prayer. If that's you, would you lift your hand in this room? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Father, I just pray for every, every person that needs hope today. I pray that you would uh, just give them a tenacity, give them uh, a gunction that just stirs them to choose hope. God, remind them of your promises for them. Not just the promises we see in scripture, but maybe the promises that you've whispered to them in a season that was a little easier. Father, that, that this moment would be a, a, a moment where their faith rises, where their hope rises, and that they would begin to choose, even though it doesn't seem hopeful, that they would choose hope in this moment. And for every person that's in within the sound of my voice that is battling anxiety in this season, Father, I pray that the, that the God of peace 
would just flow in their in their in this moment to them right now, that even in this moment, they'd feel that anxiety lift off of them, that they would feel your peace just wash over them, that this wouldn't be a season of anxiety, but this would be a a season where they get to enjoy their families or they get to enjoy just this holiday season, God, that they would see peace that literally has passed all understanding, where they've been agitated before, where they've been worried before, that that would fall off of them in this moment. In Jesus' name, we ask these things in the strong Son of God.